Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community, Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able Then On Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists. Hi, <clears throat> welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. Arlene is not here today. Uh, but before we get to our uh, topic at hand, which is a very interesting topic of being uh, visually impaired, blind, and being an author as well as having a uh, wonderful career as a psychologist, um, uh, let's thank our um, sponsors, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and many, many, many others, as well as the partnerships uh, of the Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired and the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired and many others. Um, we would like to welcome our guest, uh, Joe Covey, um, psychologist and author. Welcome to Abled and On Air. Well, it's great to be here. Okay. Yeah. Um, first, let's begin. Um, uh, you are, besides an, an uh, besides an accomplished author, uh, you are also a psychologist, despite your blindness. And you know what, Larry? Technically, I cannot describe myself as a psychologist because I do not hold a license. Okay. All right? So I can say I'm a psychotherapist. Psychotherapist. Right? I can say I work in psychology, but I, I, can't, I can't actually say I'm a psychologist. Okay. It's just a technical thing, but okay. you know, in the field. So go of, ahead. Yeah. Would you like to begin there? Despite your challenges um, with your career, uh, let's start there and then work in as uh, you being an author. Sure. Go ahead. You, the floor is yours. What would you like to know? Um, what uh, made you uh, go into your career despite your uh, challenges? Uh, it was a necessity, right? I needed something to do. Mm -hmm. I had an entire, you might say, a pro whole previous life as a sighted person. Mm -hmm. And in that life, I worked as an, I was an antique dealer, mm -hmm. and I had a very active business which made precise duplicates of historic costumes. Mm -hmm. For museums, motion pictures, historic sites, things like that. Mm -hmm. But in the early 1990s, I lost my eyesight and the business ended. And I found myself going blind without work and very bored. So 
and living on uh, living on Social Security. Mm. And I was so I was probably at that time. 32, 33, 34, mm -hmm. and um, it wasn't much of a life. I remember speaking actually with a blind psychotherapist mm. and complaining to him and saying, you know, even if I don't try, I'm probably going to live at least another 30 years, you know, barring some misadventure. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I can't, if that's, if that's what I have to do is listen just listen to the radio for the next 30 years. I don't know if I can do that. Mm. So uh, his response was, well, Joe, why don't you do what I do? Become a psychotherapist. He said, it's not that hard. You're, you're smart enough, mm. which may have been a compliment. I don't really know. Right? <laughs> it's not that hard. You're smart enough. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have to say that Psychology was not a passion of mine. It was something that if I were waiting in a, a waiting room at the dentist, I might thumb through a copy of Psychology Today. But history was my real interest. Is, but I thought, well, all right, what's, what am I going to do if push comes to shove and my eyesight really goes? Well, I could listen to people, I could think, and I could talk, and I could do this. It's comfortable work, there's no heavy lifting, air, nice comfortable chairs, talk to interesting people. So I started, I didn't, see, I did not go to college out of high school. I, did, I, had, no, I had no college background whatsoever. Mm. So I started at the beginning, and uh, it took, you know, it, the good thing is it gave structure to my life. It gave me uh, deadlines to meet, responsibilities, work. And work is the best therapy of all. So it, it provided me with a goal. And fortunately, psychology, psychotherapy is like most things in life. The more you know about it, the more interesting it becomes. Mm -hmm. So without really expecting to love the work, I was fortunate enough to find that I love the work, um, which, is, which is the same as teaching. Mm -hmm. right? I, I'm also 20 years now teaching psychology classes, college psychology classes. Now, in terms of you being an author, do you channel um, your, shall we say, your, because you know, this show, we, we focus on the abilities of people despite their challenges. Do you challenge, do, do you channel your, um, or how can I say, do you channel your blindness or is it channeled through your writing and how, how is it uh, channeled? Are you asking me if my, my blindness is evident or present in what I write? Yeah. No. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, let's talk about your books. Sure. Um, the Quiet Room. Let's start there. Uh, well, what made, what made you write, um, well, you write about the past in a lot of your books. Um, let's start there. What made you um, start writing The Quiet Room, which was quite interesting? Quiet Room and the sequel to it, Female Academy, mm -hmm. were originally written as one book mm -hmm. under the title Psychotherapy with Ghosts. Mm -hmm. And that has now become the title for a series. So there are, there are at this point three of them. And the, uh, the third one, Bound by Faith, is going to be released on November 1st. So what, what is that, 10 days? Yeah. Something like that, yeah. Uh, what, what started it, I was at my stepdaughter's home asleep or maybe not asleep in a, what they would probably call a hypnagogic state mm. around dawn mm. one morning, uh, trying to get in another 
an extra hour or so of sleep. She lives in a, a house built in 1822. So if you're familiar with old houses like that, they creak. Oh, also. they're noisy. I mean, if, if, if a cat walks across a room downstairs, you can hear it. So I was laying in bed, not quite awake, not quite asleep, I don't know. And I had a very, very distinct impression that someone came into the room, walked around the perimeter of the room, over to my side, stood over me, leaned over me, looked at me square in the face, held that position, straightened up, turned around, and walked out. And it was all silent. But it was a, a very distinct experience for me. Mm -hmm. It really gripped me. I, as I mentioned, my, my interest, really intensive interest, is in history, particularly the 19th century. So why is that? What was the main reason behind? I mean, there's been a, a lot of historical writers, but what's the main reason that you wanted to choose the 19th century? Uh, you know, I, I don't know if I chose it as much as I was born in 1957. Mm -hmm. So I was a, I was what, four, five, six years old during the Civil War centennial. Mm -hmm. And I think that made an impression on me. That's, a, that's one explanation anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the only thing I can point to that's concrete. And the second part to The Quiet Room, the female academy. Let's lead into that. Why, so, yeah. why, um, why did you call it female academy? Because much of it takes place at the Albany Female Academy, which was a real school. It was a, the Albany Female Academy was founded in 1813. Mm -hmm. It is still in operation, in fact, it, operating as <clears throat> the Albany Academy for Girls. So it, it, uh, it has the oldest women's alumna association in the world. Mm -hmm. I did not realize that there was an Albany Female Academy when I started writing into what was then one novel. There were a lot of very odd serendipitous things that happened to me in the course of writing these. Quiet Room and Female Academy were originally written as one book. But I very quickly found that in trying to find a publisher, uh, if, if one does not have a publishing track record, then the great majority of publishers are not interested in anything that is even approaching 100,000 words. Mm -hmm. Those two novels together were about 120,000 words. And I also became aware that publishers like series. They see it, and rightly so, they see it as an opportunity to sell two books or three books or four books as opposed to just one big book. Um, so yeah. so I, I had written Psychotherapy with Ghosts, these two books together, as one book, was trying to sell them to a publisher, already starting on a sequel and thinking, I don't know if I can come up with another 120,000 word sequel. So I had the brilliant idea, it worked anyway, so brilliant enough, right? Uh, I had the idea of this is what we do. We take the first 120,000 word book, we cut it in half, mm -hmm. and the third book is another 65,000 words. So when I presented the whole thing as a trilogy under the umbrella title Psychotherapy with Ghosts. Mm -hmm. I was able eventually to find a publisher. But literally, I probably did get 100 rejections. Yeah. Well, yeah. <clears throat> now, um, I looked up a small list. Well, obviously, the, the list could be longer. But there's uh, quite a few of, um, authors that are blind and visually impaired. and. Um, one of them is Oliver Sacks, Alice Walker, James Thurber, and so on and so You know, there's more. Um, for those that want to tackle um, who are visually impaired and they want to be a writer as a career, do you have any advice that you could give 
our viewing audience, um, you know, some people are scared when they write, some, you know, uh, some people channel their thoughts when they write. Do you have any advice to anybody that would like to be a writer? Who yeah, I would, say, I would say two things. Yeah. Don't. Don't. Don't even try it. Yeah, if you think you're going to make a career out of it, no, you're not. That's, you, you would have better luck buying scratch tickets. To be altogether candid, right? It's, it Why is, do you it say that? Very, it's a very difficult thing to break into. Nobody makes money at it. If, if a person is under the, under the impression that they're going to have some kind of income stream, uh, that's highly unlikely. That is highly unlikely. So you suggest that people have something else to back up? You have to. You have to, yes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm a psychotherapist. I also teach all of these things. So uh, I have not made, I haven't made any money. These books have cost me much more just in researching than I ever made in royalties or I ever actually expect to make mm -hmm. in royalties. The other part, the other part of my answer to that is, and you're asking me if someone is disabled and they want to go into writing. Well, yeah, we focus on abilities, but go ahead, yeah. Um, my advice would be focus on writing. Don't focus on your disability. Mm. I would say it's immaterial. If you, because if you're not a good writer, I don't care what you write or how disabled you are, Nobody wants to read it. Nobody wants to read it anyway, because you're unknown. If so how does a person make themselves known? Just keep writing and writing? Keep writing and keep promoting. This is, it's like, uh, <laughs> it's like a never-ending door-to-door salesman life. I'm always, I'm always hawking books. And very frequently they get given away, but I'm always selling books. I'm always trying to promote them constantly, one way or another, in every way that I can. Whether it's by word of mouth, whether it's uh, public speaking, whether it's a venue like this, uh, uh, social media, I have a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. I'm putting up a commercial on YouTube, so producing a commercial for that. Uh, I have a Facebook page, of course. Publishers, uh, as much as I have personally no interest in social media, right, so publishers you have no, insist on it. If you have no interest in social media, well, okay, well, then why do you use it? Is it is there is it a catalyst to make things better for people who want to um, <clears throat> uh, read your books? I I use it <clears throat> principally and initially because publishers will not consider a submission from someone who has no social media presence. Mm -hmm. Right? They see. Things like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, all of those things, they see that as the principal means to promote books. That used to be the publisher's job, but that was, that was the publisher's job from the 20th century. In this 21st century, publishers have given that job to their authors, by and large. It's up to the author to promote their books, and publishers see social media as the principal means to do that. Now what I've since what I have since discovered in, in my experience is that it doesn't really matter how many visits on a Facebook page, it doesn't really seem to affect sales. And I think that that is in part because the average time somebody is looking at the screen when you're at a site like Facebook is something like two or three seconds. It's very difficult to get anything across. Mm -hmm. So I have switched <clears throat> my emphasis to YouTube on the belief, expectation, yeah. and I think I am correct in this, that 
If a person goes on YouTube, they are already settling down to watch a five minute, a 10, a 30, maybe an hour long video, mm -hmm. an entire show, a program like this. Mm -hmm. So they, they are set up for uh, a more extensive, longer duration of attention. So I think that, that a YouTube channel has more potential to sell books than Facebook. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about psychotherapy with ghosts. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> since uh, you're in the psychotherapy field, um, what made you want to write that? I, and you know, so is it is it like it? So is the book set up as though you were interviewing uh, the ghosts themselves, or can you explain more about that? Parts of the book are literally psychotherapy sessions between the main 20th century protagonist and a ghost, mm -hmm. yes. Can you explain, those that don't know, what is a protagonist? Main character. Okay. Main character in any, in any fiction. Mm -hmm. So can you ex uh, give an example? Yeah, so the, the premise of the whole series is that in two parallel pro plot lines at two p points in time, in 1970, a Manhattan disillusioned, failed psychotherapist quits his practice and decides to start his life over again as an antique dealer. Mm -hmm. He buys an abandoned building on the shore of Lake Champlain, intending to make that his home, his base of operations, and discovers that one of the upstairs room in the house is haunted by the ghost of a beautiful young woman. So against his, against his better judgment and against his insistence that he's never going back into practicing psychotherapy, he finds himself sitting up all night long speaking with this woman. And of course falls in love with her. It has complications in his own personal love life. Okay. The other plot takes place more or less in 1840. And it is the story of that woman's life and what happened to her to cause her to be tra become trapped between life and death. Did you base... Um Psychotherapy would go. Did you base it on uh, uh, on your own life, or pieces of your own life, and 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 why was that? Uh, the answer to that is yes, though I would I would hasten to add that only recently did someone point out to me, Joe, you were an antique dealer and now you're a psychotherapist. This guy was a psychotherapist and became an antique dealer. Uh, you switched it around. I switched it, and it honestly didn't even occur to me. It was, it was one of, you would call that a blind spot in psychology. Mm -hmm. right? What is meant by a blind spot? Uh, it's something that's patently obvious to anyone else, but the individual is oblivious to it. Okay. Um, so, the, yeah, the main protagonist in 1970 um, he is in some ways a lot like me. He, there are many objects in the house which are objects which I have in the past owned, in some cases still do own. Um, you know, I spent, I spent the first 35 years of my life as a person with ordinary eyesight consumed with antiques. Mm -hmm. So I know these things very well and I remember them in great detail. So that, those objects and that life, that way of life, is uh, drawn from my memory quite a bit. But also, his experiences as a psychotherapist are drawn from my current, my more current or contemporary experiences. Do you uh, miss, since you are uh, blind, and you had your sight, do you 
Um, do you miss not seeing? Yes or no? And how has that uh, made you more, um, you know, um, as a or or made you better as a person? What? Let me see if I can rephrase well, that. Do I miss having eyesight? I would say yes, but not as much as I expected I would. Okay, can you explain why? I would say that in the first few years of being completely blind, which I am completely blind, I have no light perception whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing there, it's just a gray amorphous plane. Um, in the first couple of years or few years, I was much more cognizant of not being able to see things. But, you know, you can get used to just about every, anything. And I lead, I lead just as much of a visual life as I ever did. I'm just not necessarily seeing with eyesight what is actually out there. But the, you know, the occipital lobe of my brain, back here what, where eyesight happens, that's as active as it ever has been. I dream visually, and I'm keep going. And I'm constantly, I'm constantly visualizing everything. Mm -hmm. So I'm visualizing this right right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. I visualize everything all the time. Now my, and, and the, the odd phenomenon is that I develop because of that visual memories of things that I've never seen. Now, how is that, and why is that? The visual why, memory part. The why part. of that is the visual because memory. Yeah. I'm the same person as I was as the visual person, as the, the sighted Joseph Covey is the same person sitting here. He just can't see with eyesight now, but he still thinks like a sighted person. He still has this tremendous library of still and moving pictures in his mind to draw from. So I'm, my thinking processes are the same. My creative processes are the same. People have commented that these novels are very visual, and I guess they are. And I have visualized everything that takes place in them. Mm -hmm. Well, um what is your, before we end, because we have a, a couple of minutes left, what um, is your future goal as an author or a psychotherapist or both? I, don't, I wouldn't say I have any real future goals as a psychotherapist except to continue doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, as an author, I'd like to produce at least one more novel. I'd like to produce, I am working on a nonfiction work right now. Do you see any of your f books turning into um, a movie or a documentary or any of that? Of course, but that's, but that's every author's fantasy. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> of course I do, sure. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the odds that that will happen are, are not great. You know, Larry, you asked me a few minutes ago, the extent to which these books are maybe in some way autobiographical. Yeah. And I would be remiss if I did not add that uh, the point of these books really is about a relationship with God. Right. I'm not a religious person, mm -hmm. but if you had known me 30 or 40 years ago, you would have known me as the most atheistic, anti-God person you'd ever met. Mm -hmm. And that is very much not the case for me now. I am not actively religious in the sense of an organized religion, mm -hmm. but my relationship with a God is very important to me. So the, in the course of these novels, the protagonist goes from, from being a staunch atheist to becoming someone who believes that there is a God and he comes to believe that 
because of his experience with the ghost. Mm -hmm. It's a symbiotic thing. Because as he puts it, you cannot believe in ghosts and not believe in God. Mm -hmm. If you accept the existence of a spiritual dimension, then you are accepting that there is a God or a spirituality out there. So she, the ghost, saves his life because she takes him from being an atheist into someone who believes that there is a God of some sort. And he saves her life because she is trapped in that crevice between life and death mm. because of her inability to forgive God for the events of her life. So she needs him as much as he needs her. And, and that, that, is the real, that is the real story. And with that said, I would like to thank you for joining us on this edition of Abled and On Air. And when are you going to have me back? <laughs> that's, that's the real question. Very soon. Um, <laughs> is there... I'm just warming up. <laughs> yeah, you wanted a three... It's, well, it's kind of... Com well, it's not comical. You wanted a three-hour block. Um, can you um, tell people where they can reach... Uh, where they can reach you if they want to get uh, some of your books or uh, get in contact about your writing? These books are available anywhere books are sold. You can go to any bookstore and they can order it for you. Uh, if you go to the Barnes & Noble in South Burlington, they have it on the shelf. They can be ordered from Amazon. They can be ordered in all electronic forms. Kobo, Kindle, all of those things. You can okay, get these and books anywhere. Joe Joe Covey is also on YouTube. And for more information oh, yeah. on Able Than On Air and uh, and what you've seen on today's show and many other shows, you can go to www.orcamedia.net. That's www.orcamedia.net. Um, this has been um, a wonderful uh, episode of Able Than On Air. Um, Arlene is not here today. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time. Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, Empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community. Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Able and On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Able and On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rosa F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able Than On Air has been seen in the following publications, Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists.